Okay, let's move to the second project, um, <coughs> which is the adoration. I'll try to be faster on this one, um, but you understand the projects themselves, uh, they need to be explained. They need to, to, um, uh, to be shown how you proceed. They need to, the methodology itself needs to be justified. <coughs> well, here we have the, as I said, an icon, an untouchable icon in the field of art history, the Adoration of Magi in, in Florence, the biggest uh, painting by Leonardo ever, that Leonardo ever painted in the Uffizi. And it's always been considered the way it is and the way you look at it, just all by Leonardo. Well, <clears throat> what do we know about this painting? Again, let's go back to a little bit of history. In 1481, we know that it was, Leonardo was commissioned by uh, Augustinian uh, um, uh, friars from the convent of these uh, in um, near Florence, San Donato in Scopeto, and um, but it was a very unusual contract. Even though it seems that probably his father, who became the notarian just a couple of years earlier, uh, or so, of the friars, <clears throat> could have helped getting him this job. Well, the contract was quite unusual because it was true that. First of all, he was not given money. He was given a property in, in Colle Valdelsa, a property, actually a third of a property in Colle Valdelsa, of a piece of land. And, uh, <clears throat> but he could not sell it. He could keep it, and he had to keep it for at least three years, and then he could sell it back to the friars if they so they wanted. But he could not do anything with it. He, cannot put, he couldn't cash it in, any money. In addition, and if in case the friars after three years wanted to buy it back, they would have paid a good chunk of money, 300 florins. But where's the catch? The catch is that meanwhile, he had to pay 150 florins for a dowry to a lady uh, that was in the contract. So unfortunately, Leonardo did not have this kind of money. And so he had, and in addition, he had to pay for the colors and the gold and everything else necessary to to do the, this masterpiece. Finally, another uh, part of the contract stated that he had to deliver the painting done uh, between uh, 20 in 24 hours and 24 months, maximum 30 months. If that didn't happen, that he would have to leave the painting to the friars and they would have done whatever they wanted with it. Well, that happened in, um, in March, 1481. In June, well, he had already to give up, meaning that he did not have any money, so he had to borrow money from the friars. In addition, he could not pay the dowry, so the friars had to pay for the dowry. So he borrowed, uh, and he borrowed um, a grain, uh, um, firewood, uh, and just even, even wine. Um, he couldn't do practically anything. Well, one thing we know, though, that he managed to do, as we will see, an incredibly, incredibly beautiful masterpiece. Well, strangely enough, 1481, uh, just uh, September was the last payment, well, last payment, no last payment, actually in September we have a record of Leonardo getting wine from the friars, not, not money. <clears throat> well, I don't want to say no wonder why he left, but let's say that <laughs> early next year he went to Milano. Uh, Myland, and where he stayed for almost 20 years. Well, what happened to the painting then? Again, we go back to history. All we know, as, as is stated here, is that from 1481 to 1568, we have the Adoration of Magi mentioned just in the second edition of the Vitae by Vasari, not the first one. <coughs> so. We have to wait, as I said, not 1550, but 1568, just to get a mention of the adoration, where specifically, they don't, uh, Vasari doesn't say that he saw the painting in the house of the Benchi. Benchi's family were, well, okay, uh, I'm sure art historians can tell you much more about the Benchi's family than I can, <clears throat> but just the Benchi is a portrait of a uh, Benchi is, um, uh, it's a very beautiful painting by Leonardo at the National Gallery in Washington, just to, you know, to refresh your memory. <clears throat> well, 
we have to go all the way to 1621. So there is not a precise account. There is not a single document. There is not a, 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 any record of where this painting from 1481 to 1681 was located. In 1621, Don Antonio de' Medici, finally, uh, he, uh, in his records of his belongings, we find uh, cited the adoration. So here again, we have a void. Okay? We have a void for the, one of the top most important paintings we have in Italy. Just a gigantic void, 140 years. That's a long period of time for such a masterpiece, not to know anything. And then uh, just to update you, 1670, the first time that is, uh, was brought to the Uffizi, where you can see it today in the room uh, um, 15. <clears throat> well, the friars, for sure we know this, that they waited at least 15 years before they call in another artist, Filippino Lippi, because they just wanted their beautiful adoration as an altarpiece to be put on the main altar. So <clears throat> I guess uh, they waited that long because they were hoping that Leonardo would come back from Milan. But he never did, or at least he didn't do it on time, he just because he came back in the 1500, uh, just at the 1500. So you might nevertheless see that there is some resemblance. Uh, I mean, it's not casual, this resemblance, as if Filippino Lippi could have seen at least the, as we will see, the, the drawing, the incredibly beautiful drawing that Leonardo did. Um, it cannot be just a coincidence to see, and it takes an art historian to go step by step. I'm not going to go through that. I'm just saying, just uh, as a uh, simple comparison, you might see that there are some, uh, <clears throat> some very peculiar resemblance, uh, uh, this figure, this figure, this one, and um, um, I could go on and on. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see all the screen here. Okay. Um, and also this figure here with this one that is supposedly should be the portrait, self-portrait of, uh, of Leonardo. <coughs> well, so we know practically nothing about this painting for a big part of time. And we started with the same, more or less, the same methodological approach as you've seen uh, before for the monument, for the search of the Bell of Anghiari. Art history research, as we've done on documents research, and then scientific research. And the scientific research was done just as if we had a patient in our hands. Diagnostic imaging and analytical diagnostics. But we have to keep in mind one fact. In medicine, first, there is a doctor, and there are no doctors in our field. Second, um, a doctor, when is checking a patient, he knows the anatomy of the patient. We don't. The anatomy of the masterpiece, we don't know. By default, we don't know. Otherwise, it would be a, an industrial production. So every time we, we tackle the understanding, the study of a work of art, we start from scratch, literally from scratch. And that's always the challenge. But if we don't do this, how can we pretend, how we think, to be able to say, hey, we understand the pathologies, we understand the decay processes, but first you have to understand the anatomy. But to understand the anatomy, then you have to follow a specific methodological approach as if you were with a real patient. With a difference, another major difference, is that we have to go to the patient and not the other way around. So we have to think about technologies that could be brought to the patient every time, wherever the patient could be located, in a church, in a castle, in a bank, in a house. And that is a real challenge. But if we don't do this, how, how do we expect to do uh, conservation? Just giving to our works of art in the hands of restorers, which they will work at the best of their knowledge, but surely they will need way much more knowledge in terms of objective knowledge about the artwork than uh, is expected to just to be seen with your eyes or to be sensed with your you know, good touch as a restorer. Now, believe me, no, I'm not knocking down restorers. We need them as we need surgeons. But there is another difference. The surgeon is first a doctor and then he specializes in surgery. A restorer, at least in my country, can open up a new uh, activity tomorrow morning with no previous knowledge.
and is an artisan, mostly, basically, is an artisan. So we need to update this figure as well. We need to create a new scientist as well, and then specialize in restoration that is specialized in surgery. That it goes for works of art, as it would go for a new breed of architects, where they first understand the anatomy of the building and the pathology, and then they decide, so they do real conservation. Um, I'm not going to go through all the exams. I'm, I'm just, uh, th th those were just laid out. And then multiple, spe multispectral imaging. That, it's basic, it's fundamental. Multispectral imaging means that you're using different spectral um, wavelength and you build up images, therefore, as if you were slicing the painting um, and see one under the other, but then compiling all these different images and then zooming in and out and fading in and out. So that even though we are talking about 300, 500 microns only, there is a whole world inside that needs to be uncovered because that's where the genesis, the answers about the genesis, the answers about the anatomy are located. But then we need to develop this much further that has been done so far. But it would be fascinating for any audience to have a walk through uh, inside a painting and finally understand it just because we see it, because it's brought to our attention in a, in a very clear way how a, an artist from normal, simple material managed to create a masterpiece. That's the mystery we have to unveil. And then, rightly so, the art historian will take over and will explain about the, um, the, all the, um, the right interpretation that needs to be done <coughs> to the painting in order to place it correctly in a certain frame of time, in a certain style, <coughs> compared to other works of art. In other words, to tell us the iconography, the iconology, that's fine. But first, we have to be able to come to the understanding of how this miracle happened how a masterpiece was created from practically nothing. So multispectral imaging, it's really important. This was a very big panel. I mean, it still is a very big panel, sorry. Um, it's, as you can see, it's two and a half meters, just about, it's almost a square, and has been uh, the composite of uh, 10 planks, and just glue them together as a, as a wood support by uh, Poplar. Um, unfortunately has been cut just about almost 10 centimeters in the lower portion because it was so ruined, it was, the wood was so rotten, we don't know when though. But what I found the first time I turned the painting around, I found that there were a lot of cracks, even more visible in the back than in the front, just because in the front, they, you know, they, they were restored. They were, they were hidden by restorations. So I said, well, we can just not just take a picture and see, okay, there are cracks. I mean, it has to be something more important, more reliable, more scientifically sound than just taking pictures or just uh, taking, you know, be aware there are cracks. So I just wanted to try something that is normally done, uh, used in the movie business and uh, what is called uh, the 3D modeling with structure light. Well, this time I tested on, on this painting. It was the first time I ever done on a painting. Normally it's done on a 3D object. And you would expect that, well, where is the third dimension in this object? Well, there is a third dimension. It depends on the scale um, that you're using. In our, in, in our case, even a, a difference of 50 microns of, uh, from, uh, from a flat surface uh, could make a difference, could crack the paint. Uh, could mean something that the, the support, the overall support is moving. So. Uh, we tested, and indeed, we were able to, it was pretty long, I must say, eh? quite difficult, but we were able just uh, to shine a, a grid of light, <coughs> first on a reference uh, pattern, a reference surface, a very flat surface, and then capture that image, and then do the same on an unknown surface, like the surface of the, of the adoration, and then compare. And we were able to get to reach a, a, a very high precision, up to 50 microns. So we have built up uh, a 3D model with that kind of precision, which is our reference for future comparison in time, how the, the, the panel overall, the system is going to move, where, 
and how can we measure that? So that's preventive conservation, I would call it, or preventive medicine. And uh, unfortunately, you would think that this is done. No, at all. <clears throat> all right, let's go ahead and explain very fast how this painting was done. So on top of the poplar ten planks, wood um, ten planks, <clears throat> a two layers of gesso ground uh, were brushed on gesso ground with a soft, um, calcium sulfate, but mixed with uh, the calcium sulfate um, fibers of cotton, linen, and tow T O W were mixed together just to absorb uh, the the movement of the ten planks, you know? so not to have a, such a rigid, uh, even fine structure sitting on top of the, uh, and, and being able to absorb this move, movement. Um, it was, well, it's quite un, not, not so unusual. Normally, uh, what they'd done at that time, they just put uh, glued on all, all over the surface, uh, um, just the canvas, or just stripes of canvas along the the join lines of the of the different planks. So here you have um, gesso gross and gesso fine, so the first coarse layer, very much thicker, and then follow up by a finer layer. <clears throat> and here, with a scanning electron microscopy, you could zoom in in one single crystal and make the analysis that that was indeed a crystal calcium sulfate. Um, by the way, the image that you have seen previously here. Uh, there is this one here is a cross section of um, about 400 microns in height, okay, in thickness. So that's the size. Don't be, I mean, it's blown up uh, quite, quite a lot. But don't don't get uh, the right understanding, the wrong understanding. I mean, we are talking ex uh, to um, of samples so small that, as a matter of fact, to to be able to to take them. We use a, a stereo microscope with 15 enlargements. So just for you to know, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, they were, were even hard to, to handle. They were so tiny. And they were embedded in a polyester resin and then cut orthogonally. And so we could see the stratification. Um, even with the x-ray, it shows very nicely all the position of the different fibers. And that's how I can tell you that those fibers were mainly and even more uh, um, um, embedded in, um, in the gesso ground along the junction lines of the different planks. And these are the fibers I've been talking about. Uh, unfortunately, the, the lower part is so rotten that um, well, pieces were falling on the ground, so that was not necessary to take any sample for that. <clears throat> but luckily, though, uh, the, the painting went under uh, a restoration for the support, and that problem, at least, has been solved uh, for some time now. All right, uh, these are the fibers I was telling you about. We were able even to identify the, some of these fibers. As you can see here, uh, we have some uh, sodium, uh, uh, chlorine, and um, sulfur. So some of these fibers were indeed just, just uh, debris uh, taken from, uh, from clothes, uh, color uh, fibers. Well, then we use a, um, a portable X-ray fluorescence unit just to get a first understanding of, in addition of the cross-section, in addition of the, of the uh, gesso ground, what else was there since uh, it looked monochromatic. So what kind of pigments could have been uh, there <clears throat> uh, mixed with a lot of other stuff, as you will see. So just shining an X-ray beam and collecting <clears throat> the the, the uh, uh, making a spectroscopy of, of each point being examined, and that is uh, in, uh, in, the, in the thickness going through, going inside the painting, so from the surface all the way to the wood support. We collected a lot of these, uh, of these spectra, and we managed to find out that everywhere we looked, we could find uh, uh, lead peaks, okay? So there was lead just about everywhere. I could not figure out, even uh, when we were hitting um, the, the leaves of the tree rather than the brown of the ground always led everywhere. So again, the cross-section analysis helped us to define that on top of the gesso grossa gesso fine, there was a, a primary layer of lead white just brushed all over the surface. But 
under the the tiny, just about just about 40 microns, uh, 35, 40 microns uh, layer of priming of lead white, there was the underdrawing. So Leonardo, what he did, this is, uh, go through this, this in a second. <clears throat> Leonardo, what he did, he first made the drawing. Then he covered with a very thin layer of uh, uh, lead white. And that made the drawing, first of all, protected and that's why we see it today, by the way. Uh, and second, it, make it, look, it made it look still visible, but it became gray, being a dark covered by a thin layer of white. And so his intention is quite obvious that he wanted to use as a guideline for his composition a drawing that will still retain his position once you brush on on top of it. And that was a genius, a stroke of genius, because hardly you will see this happening. Most of the time, um, once the artist went on with the brush over the, the drawing, the, the, the tiny uh, crystals of charcoal uh, would just be scattered everywhere. Well, the last thing he did, with just a little bit of, a, of the sky painted on top, we will go through that, <clears throat> he just modeled. He added some highlights which are of, uh, of lead white and just modeled those highlights with, with, his, uh, with his fingers. And that's what you see here. Um, these are just uh, fingerprints, as I've seen many others with x-ray of the, of the painting. And the reason, um, and by the way, the best way to make sure that you're looking at a fingerprint reliable Reliable doesn't mean that belongs to an artist. Reliable means that it was not put in just years uh, before or just today, is to check the x-ray. Because uh, <clears throat> that is under the, the surface layer of the color. In that case, you'll be sure that those are contemporary to the making of the, of the painting. Well, we have, I collected a lot of fingerprints associated to works of art by Leonardo. And here there are just a couple. Then uh, if we go to the Annunciation, I have many more, I mean, by, by the dozens. Um, because that was one of his techniques, just to work with his fingertips. As well as uh, on the uh, baptism by Verrocchio and Leonardo, that would be another beautiful story to be, to be shown and to be narrated, how the anatomy of this painting and how many artists participated, not just two, but that's another story. And as you can see here in the forehead, you see the, the lines of the, the fingerprints? They're just everywhere. And in the case of the, of the Christ being baptized, there are two layers. One that is, is, the, is, the same, is done is the same technique as the St. John the Baptist, which seems to be just the typical of the Rocchio. But on top of that, there is another coat of lead white, just totally modeled with fingers. Well, just to throw that in, just to know how much more about the most important masterpieces, we still start from scratch about truly understanding them. All right, now let's go to the most uh, crucial part, and then finally we'll see some beautiful drawings, and I'm, I will try to run as fast as I can, but I think this is quite crucial because it took me a couple of years to go through in different countries to prove to art historians that I was not totally out of my mind when I was saying that the paint was not made, uh, it was not applied contemporary to the drawing. Well, I'll show you just two of the sequel of evidences that I collected for obvious reasons of time. Well, let's make this very simple eye uh, comparison. Here you have the stratification of the gesso ground and then <coughs> Uh, the gesso grosse and gesso fine. Uh, this is the, the priming layer of lead white. And this is a very thin layer of, with some uh, uh, blue uh, crystals of uh, lapis lazuli, which is, this was taken, as you see, number five, just up here, um, because uh, there is a little bit of a blue uh, right all on top of the, of the priming layer, just on, on the top of part of, uh, of this painting as you might expect, you know, to see the sky. All right, but now look, you see the same stratification here on um, um, sample number six, where you see again the, um, the gesso, the priming, 
this sort of uh, dark uh, granules belong to the underdrawing. And then you have a, a very thick layer of varnish, but we'll go through that in a second. <clears throat> but in any case, what I'm trying to say is that the layer priming, you see, is very regular, uh, is very homogeneous, where homogeneous is still layers. But if we go and check other cross sections, now here, for example, um, this tiny, very homogeneous layer is practically gone. We just see a few, uh, just a little bit, and then we see crystals of lead white just floating, like a bit, the, the binding media was dissolved. We move to the right and see even more just uh, uh, aggregates of, uh, of uh, lead white crystals uh, just uh, uh, in uh, undefined stratification. Again, in the lower part, bottom right and bottom left is the same. You see, as if something altered this continuity of this stratification and what could have been, since I've seen this many times, not just on this painting, that's the result of cleaning. That's the result of using a solvent which dissolves the binding media. Especially in the top part, then they, you just get aggregates of, uh, of crystals that once you brush on with another coat of paint or varnish, then will be engulfed and they will be mixed together and then they will be distributed unevenly, uh, whatever. And that's exactly what you get. This is the, these are all cross sections and then compare where the, the even priming layer instead was is still intact. Okay? But that's not all. Let's see the second point. And let's take, a, let's say, a cross section out of this tree on the left hand side of the painting. Well, here we see something even more unusual. We do see um, our priming layer still more or less uh, visible. And then a little bit of the sky with a very tiny and very few um, crystals of lapis lazuli, but then you see a crack, a fissure, an aging crack, through which sinks in all this paint that sits on top, meaning that the surface was already aged and cracked by the time that the, the brown paint was added. And that's why it just went inside. And you can see this in a, just about everywhere. Look here, see? That's the typical uh, well, uh, crack, aging crack. Now, we can speculate how long it could take, but that's not really only the point because we have seen before that in any case the painting, don't forget that we don't know anything about the painting because we have a black fat hole of 140 years. Could have been stored in God knows where, uh, surely not at the at the, at the monastery because uh, early in uh, around the 1510, uh, just before the siege of Florence, uh, the monastery was, the mo was destroyed. And so it, I'm sure the painting was brought to, uh, to Florence, but it could have stayed there for just about uh, almost 20 years. If we're stored in any place simply because it was not considered a full painting, uh, but just a drawing on a huge panel. Maybe the friars didn't care that much after all. And in any case, they, they didn't know what to do uh, until Filippino Lippi came in and finally got them the, 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 the adoration, a typical adoration that they just wanted. <clears throat> now, it is not speculative to say that this could have happened. It is uh, surprising for me to say that no one has really done any specific search on this matter. In any case, it remains the fact that the surface has been cleaned before it was painted, and the surface was aged and cracked before it was painted. I mean, talking about the surface of the priming layer. Well, I will, skip, I will skip some of them, but you see everywhere it's quite obvious um, that uh, the, uh, the top brown layers are sinking in the uh, aging cracks. Even more. Uh, this cross-section here tells you that on top, after the first uh, brown layer sank inside the cracks already formed, the aging cracks I was saying before, now here, this very th thin line, this is a UV fluorescence uh, uh, image taken of the cross-section, 
it shows a fluorescence typical of the presence of a thin layer of varnish. That's the typical fluorescence of a varnish. Well, on top of which, another dark layer was positioned. And finally, a lot of uh, a very several layers of varnishes. So here we are with not only um, brown paint added, not contemporary to um, the drawing and the priming color of the drawing, but also in a second time, we did in, in fact um, it did happen that uh, the um, a second layer of again this brownish stuff was added. But look. The IR image of the same area where the sample was taken here shows indeed that first the leaves sunk inside the color of the leaves sunk inside sunk inside the, the, the aging cracks, but also a, another coat of just charcoal, uh, hard, barely diluted with uh, with uh, with glue, was added on top, even to hide more, as we will see, what was intentional was was the intention of Leonard. So, and here is the same cross-section scene in reflected visible light. It's undoubtedly that all this stuff, brown stuff, which are they, by the way, the leaves of the tree, um, they sink in. In other words, everywhere, uh, and let's say, let's take this, which is a classic icon for the adoration. Sorry about that, but uh, it happens that that is not exactly so, uh, or at least not anymore, because if you see the cross section of these brush strokes, um, dark brush strokes, and then again you see that it's practically vanished the layer of priming and just few uh, um, granules of lead white, which in the scanning electron microscope uh, view they really show very clearly, and on top of which you see these uh, red, um, black granules are the um, the charcoal, uh, much coarse charcoal that has been brushed on to cover and, uh, and to reinforce just the faded underdrawing. Which means, tr translated in other words, that what you see there, those black lines, that those black brush strokes do not belong to Leonardo. And since it is proven up to now that Leonardo never went back to finish this painting, never went back even to try to finish it. Uh, and since it's proven that was damaged, as the cross-section analysis can show you, well, this is a strong evidence to me, at least to, um, to move further down the line and to understand even more what really happened and to search for more documents, why not? Now look, again, we are same, uh, uh, looking at the same figure. See here, this is the figure we are used to see. This is a pseudo-color infrared image um, it, at 1.1 micron, okay? Not even that penetrating. And look what it shows, a different profile. You see the chin, and you find here the lips, and the nose, and the head. So the whole thing was originally lower. That's why uh, that arm does not belong to the original layout. <clears throat> but the same thing happened just about everywhere. Now look, this is a flu UV fluorescence, ultraviolet fluorescence image that shows you how much stuff has been put on top. In this case, a lot of varnish that it really flu fluorescence, fluorescence a, a lot. But if you go through that fluorescence and you see um, the, the pseudo-color infrared uh, um, uh, photography, then uh, you might see just black everywhere. But you would say, wait, but I see the folds, I, I see some highlights. Well, let's go and see what those highlights are all about. And if we take just the one of these highlights, there is the certification you get. This is the underneath drawing. This is the prime layer with some damage, just some damage, just a little bit of uh, <clears throat> dissolving uh, binding media. And here, a very thick layer just of carbon, just to cover the underdrawing. And on top of which, a highlight just to shape up a little bit of this black covering. Um, I'm almost at the end of this sequence, and then finally we'll see the wonders that is underneath. And I think it's about time. 
Uh, but you see, it's a serious business. I mean, I'm talking to an audience, a UCSD of scientists. I don't dare to fool around and just say, well, for me it's not, okay? <clears throat> so here you have, a, a, again, taken of, of, out of the a sample of the, from the background. Again, you, you see a lot of uh, dissolved you know, granules, uh, clusters of granules of, uh, of uh, lead white, and then you see a several stratification of brownish stuff to reddish uh, to black according to the quantity of carbon or <clears throat> organic stuff that was mixed with it. This is by, by no means is a typical sequence stratification of related to any painting technique as far as I've seen since I've studied over 2,300 of them. And, and I can assure you, it does not have anything to do with the technique of Leonardo, known so far with scientific examination stuff. <clears throat> All right, this is the layout, what it would show uh, if you were to see it with uh, just the uh, pseudo call infrared photography. And so every, every, everything you see, brownish or, br or dark, including the trees, by the way, that's it's added later after it was damaged and after it was aged and cracked. So that is a sort of a color coding to check what has been added, okay? And here is the overall color coding uh, put in together three wavelengths, the UV fluorescence, and then uh, the pseudocolor IR photography. I have several others, but just to show you that how I went step by step, layer after layer, from macro to micro to understand the stratification, the genesis, the anatomy of the painting. All right, finally, let's see what is under all this that we know that was not put in at the same time that the drawing. And since the technique is so awful, and here I am saying it because I've never seen it as, uh, as so bad, so uh, a worse technique ever applied, especially to a, to a masterpiece like this, uh, here finally, uh, let's go through all this, and let's almost through all this, because the carbon, in some cases, the carbon layer was so thick that it was almost too impossible to penetrate up to now. Maybe we can do better. So let's suppose we're using an infrared camera operating this time in up to 2.2 microns uh, with a video tube, unfortunately, with all the limitation that that brings, um, rather than, um, well, other solutions that I'm not going to go through now, but... <clears throat> Let's say they are feasible and they are easily done. Uh, this is the layout of 2,400 images that with a Levitican tube I, ha I could take. The resolution, uh, uh, it's about roughly 300 microns. <clears throat> and so I went very far, very close to the surface to capture uh, each single image and it took a while. Now, if I had just a, a, a system, let's say, with a photodiode just capturing each single pixel, I wouldn't have had to go through all this, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> so now let's start seeing, first of all, the drawing, the layout, the perspective of that Leonardo did before he started to uh, draw the figures of the animals, of the people, the architecture, and so forth. First a very precise layout of the perspective. As a matter of fact, the lines we see on the left-hand side of the painting, they just cross all through. I mean, they are there to be seen with infrared, with near-infrared rays, <clears throat> all the way to the other side. And here you see how from um, uh, the distance between the lines, it gets shorter and shorter the higher you go, meaning that he wanted to make uh, a 3D rendering a 3D uh, real perspective of the story he was telling us. Well, those are the lines I found, and that is the drawing of the adoration on paper done before the painting. But on paper, we're talking about just about 10 inches long, okay? And it's incredible, and this has been studied just recently. I just finished to study it about just before coming over here, uh, the drawing of the adoration. And look, this is, what, this is the layout of the architecture. On a piece of paper, truly, is this small. Look how precise his layout of the perspective was. Absolutely perfect. And people were, well, I don't want to say in general, but let's say 
I read many times about um, his uh, knowledge or lack of knowledge about perspective. Well, to my understanding, he knew what he was doing since he was also working on such a small piece of paper. <clears throat> and this is, uh, by the way, what you see here is the overall uh, layout of the perspective and then the drawing done with the charcoal and then on top of which he then painted with a small paint uh, brush uh, m uh, dipped in ink uh, the figures that you see. So we could selectively see not only this part but also if we just like cancel out all the painting, uh, all the ink that he added, we can see the original uh, drawing of the perspective plus the architecture plus the figures as they were drawn before being painted. And uh, this is uh, something that has not never been seen, obviously, because I just finished about 10 days ago. Um, as well as here, you can see quite well just going through the paint and you um, extract just the drawing very nicely. So imagine to do the other way around, just to map those two with the same geometry and then moving in and out. And it, it, a drawing that, first of all, no one can see because it's so precious. It's not, it's not that you can pass it around. Uh, just to, to blow it up to, to any size if you have the proper technology, but then also to see it under to see how it was developed, it was created. All right, now let's go back to the painting and let's start seeing appearing figures that are not visible to the naked eye. That is the drawing of Leonardo. Okay? Now look, this, this um, layman is pulling up a stone. Okay? He's lifting up a stone where it's not here. At the same time, you can see the drawing of the tree uh, that he did. So those trees, it's not that we're not, in a, we're not thought of at all, but we're not painted by him. Let's move on. This is the detail of, uh, of the column which, which sits uh, right here. And up to now, we could not see it. Well, it happens that this column is not Dorica, uh, Doric, it's not Corinthians, it's not Ionic. It could very well be something that reminds of Egyptian capital, maybe. Well, let's leave it to other moment uh, but nevertheless, it's quite unusual. Just to be found in, uh, let's say, uh, in this adoration, or in any case, was never been, was not possible to see it before. So this is a lot of ground to cover for art historians, and I'm glad to provide all this to art historians because that's the way it should be. Science should provide art historians the proper um, uh, data, objective data, in order for them to uh, give us back the right reading of the, uh, the right interpretation of the iconography and iconology. <clears throat> Look here. That's on the, your left hand side is what very large, uh, otherwise it, it's, a, it's in about five uh, inches large, the, the, this detail on the left hand side. And this is the UV. You can see all this brownish stuff that fluoresces a little bit, uh, which uh, has been just brushed on just to cover what we are going to see now, plus layers over layers of varnish, again, to cover. And that's what we get. Now, that is the masterpiece of Leonardo. And that exactly is what Leonardo finally left us for us to see. And not really, and thanks to the scientific approach that was finally used. Now, see some of these details. These are very tiny figures. He had uh, just he captured the motion in every single instant of every single little figure, the physiognomy. Uh, it's everything, it looks like it is moving. And these are indeed on top of the staircase, and they are working to rebuild the ruined temple that up to now was believed just a ruined temple. No, they are rebuilding this temple from scratch. In other words, it's like the new world that, is, that uh, comes out from the ruins of the old world. In other words, the iconology does change. Look this one, for example. You see, uh, with your naked eye, you can see this head and the torso and the legs, but you don't see this figure. 
So there is Leonardo with tiny, tiny figures. He could just, he had such a complete knowledge, not only of the of anatomy of horses, but also of the body, of the human body. And we are talking about 1481. So the overall look of this first portion, and by the way, I have uh, brightened up a lot this image because it's, it does look much darker than uh, once you go and see it uh, in real. You see, here we have a totally different um, action going on, a totally different meaning, therefore, as a result. Or if you compare the drawing on paper, again, with this part of the, of the drawing uh, under the paint, you see how he envisioned already, he had in mind already to have all this layment, all these workers on top of the, of the architecture. And so no wonder, no surprise that we finally found also under the paint exactly the same theme. Look, this horse, how mo more beautiful, but also can you see a face right here? See, there is a profile, the chin, the mouth, and the nose and the, and the eye. Um, it's a sequel, it's a, just a one after the other of uh, discoveries. This again has been brightened up a lot, but the reason why I wanna show you this is because it was covered with such a thick layer of carbon that even at two microns you cannot go through. As a matter of fact, look, just that is the technique used by this unknown artist, just paint over and over and over with a clear intention just to cover parts. Why? Well, we could, all know, we could go on speculating, but I'd rather say that that was indeed the result of um, an attempt to not to show certain parts of the painting. Why? Well, I'll leave it up to, uh, to a better understanding by art historians. I could have my ideas, but I don't think that is so relevant right now to say, rather than <clears throat> undoubtedly some of these figures, which are extremely beautiful, were totally covered. And the fact that they were covered does change the iconology of the painting. So that should not be underestimated. Remember that Leonardo was indeed very advanced in his genius, was indeed way much more advanced than that with all respect of the Augustinian friars maybe, that they ordered just a, a standard beautiful panel just to place on top of their main altar. And maybe what he did was too far advanced. All this motion, all these symbols that he threw in um, anticipated by my many, many years what other artists later tried to catch up with. Look, this other figure here, all this uh, dark paint, remember, has been added later. Now see, see the difference? Now this, you, you know, art history, or the books of art history, you know, they, they, they showed us always this profile. Well, that's not so. Look, the root, true profile is down here. Follow the pointer. That's the nose right here. And that's the mouth. And that's the beard. And this line here, it's just a line added with, with, uh, this, uh, on top of the background. But it doesn't have anything to do with the original profile. Now look here. It's inconceivable now that you will see the next picture that Leonardo could have done something like this for the simple reason that that is what he had in mind. And rocks, just for you who are more familiar with art history of this time, as you can see in the painting of, that ba of the baptism by Verrocchio and Leonardo, just the same layout of rocks. Rocks that he kept painting and drawing over and over throughout his life. Now, this is what we have been used to consider Leonardo. Again, see how more, you know, clearly, finally, we can appreciate what he had in mind, or in, in some cases, simply, we cannot see with our eyes at all. We cannot even guess what it could have been behind. Look at this image, for example. 
See this profile, follow the pointer, that's the forehead, that's the nose, that's the eye. But there is another one, that's again the forehead, that's the eye, that's the nose, with the nose, and here is the mouth and the chin. See the two lips? And I could go on and on. There are so many hidden figures. But now, I, I'm very pleased to show you this one. It's a way to thank you all, and it's not the last one, but surely it's the most beautiful one that I, I've seen in many years, and I've studied more than one painting by Leonardo. And I think this is per se a masterpiece that needs to be reevaluated, need, needs to be known worldwide. And I have that pleasure to show you for the first time. <laughs> Again, look at these. Each single one is a masterpiece. And everyone, you can feel from anyone just motion, just expression, life, and this absolute knowledge of anatomy that he had. And this is an early work. Now look how many profiles are here. Just, just catch one, two, three, four. See? What do you see there? Totally covered by carbon. The manger. We could not see the manger. There is no manger. Yes, there is a manger. But it was not the focal point for Leonardo. In his storytelling, us was not the focal point. He just placed it aside. And there you go. You find the, the structure of the manger. You find the, the, uh, the, the animals in the manger. But now you might say, what this elephant has to do with it? <laughs> Well, let's go back a second. That tiny elephant, obviously the first one, that probably the last one, but we never know with Leonardo, that he painted, is not just strolling around for his own sake. It's there, it must be seen in perspective. As if we do this, then it's telling us a moment of the story, coming of the Magi. No? But it was totally concealed to the eye. Again, uh, these rocks do not belong to the face of the drawing. Each single rock that you see now has been painted later. But if you get rid of all those rocks, then the elephant finally is in the right place, at the right height, and the right proportion. Look here. Now we move in the last scene, OK? And we are seeing part of the battle scene that is on top right of the painting, which you'll see how fascinating that was, perhaps uh, just as fascinating as the group of figures that I show you. And here you see wounded bodies, you wounded soldiers. There is one here, see? That's the head, the arm, and the back. It's wounded, it's collapsing to the ground. Also, this other guy is protecting his face with an arm like this. Or this guy probably wounded again. He's sort of uh, resting on, uh, on this uh, uh, rock. It's, in other words, it's a very bloody battle scene that finally we see. And you see, that is a ferocious fight. This is not just a skirmish between two riders and horses, as we are used to see now. And now, let's see the riders and horses, the two horses that we are used to see. That is, the, it's in between the iconology and the iconography we have been taught of. Well, they're quite different. But first, let's see what he had in mind when he drew the painting. When he, sorry, when he drew on paper and he had the first idea of these horses. This is the first image, by the way, that is being shown. And see, tiny, tiny figures, just about two inches high. He had just uh, this know-how, the anatomy of horses, of, and uh, put them in motion, 
that it was inconceivable at that time for any artist, for that matter. That's what is under. And look, see how many times he just drew the position of the right arm of this warrior, as how they, the two horses are tangled, almost like if they're fighting each other. Look, the expression of the, of the face. I go back, what do you see here? You just miss one of the most important feature of his creativity, of his stroke of genius in this painting. Or also, just check this. See here, you see nothing at all. But you're missing not only beautiful, a beautiful head of a horse, but also, you see, there is a line, the line of the horizon. So it's not that he just drew just half, I mean, just the head of a horse. This is a fight. It's a big fight that goes on in the, in the background. But with all this canceling, covering, we lost the sense of it. Just imagine if we could recreate this in 3D and just finally see it in the right perspective as he thought in his mind. Again, for art historians to scratch their head, look, that is a drawing up to now attributed to a much later time in life of Leonardo, and yet is identical to the drawing that sits under the paint that we are used to consider by Leonardo. So that's, that's our job. That's to provide true objective knowledge to art historians. This is the whole battle scene. Look, it's way, way much more intricate, much more violent. And it looks like a movie. Everything is in motion. It, it's, it, we have to conceal, conceive this as if he tried to see, OK, I do the next step, and then the next step, and what will happen to this one? So he really had in mind a sense of motion almost as if we, we see a movie today. And we go back to the Battle of Anghiari. Why? Well, because 1481, 24 years earlier, he had already in mind this fighting scene. And that's exactly what we go back to the beginning. And at least we have his initial version of the battle 24 years earlier. And at least this time we can see it. Well, before I take the last two minutes, let me first say that I could talk about remarks and comments and the things to do for, for such a long time. But I would like to say, while you are reading some of these notes that I put down, that first of all, <clears throat> the need for applied science in this field. They need to create a new discipline. They need to create a new breed of scientists. And all this to be offered to the young generations of scientists because it's a wonderful job. Because it's a wonderful opportunity to be not only creative in your knowledge and your understanding, but also to contribute to make everybody aware of how all these masterpieces mankind uh, managed to create, and how we can help slowing down at least the decay process of all this, and making everybody aware of the significance of our cultural heritage, putting them in a position, uh, in the frame, proper frame, so that they understand. They don't need to go through any translation, so to speak, or interpretation, but first thing, we should provide them with the proper understanding of how a work of art was created. Monument, statue, mural painting, painting on canvas and on, on, uh, on wood. Well, all I can say, first of all, very my warmest thanks to <coughs> Professor Fung, first of all, and then Professor Chen, of the, who is the chairman of the Department of Bioengineering, who <coughs> were so nice, and I had the honor and the privilege to be invited last year, and I was awarded by them 
of a recognition for what I've been trying to do. And naturally, I like to, even though I don't, I don't think he's here, but uh, Professor Walter Monk and his wife for what I've done to make all this happening in my life. And um, <clears throat> now that I know she's here, I'd like to thank Dr. Lily Chang for all the support she has given me since uh, she dropped in my office out of nowhere. And she, together with uh, Raymond Hardy, who did the same, and they somehow they got interested to what, in what I was doing. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, Cal... Kalit 2, Kalit Square, um, and um, David Ramsey that has been uh, very helpful to me and uh, this incredible organization for this conference, and therefore the Alumni Association as a whole, which I feel that I'm part of it, and I'm proud to be part of it, as I'm proud to be um, a UCSD alumni, alumnus. And finally, thank you all for the patience and the time you gave me to support me in all this. And David, to explain to you so much.